We have just heard from some courageous people standing up against the anti-rights movements, which are pushing back progress on gender equality around the world. And you know what? It sounded like pretty impressive stuff. No, very impressive. I thought the menstrual health session was really good too. And I love the use of technology to really empower our young people. And that app, Oki, seems amazing and seems to be very useful in safeguarding young people's privacy and how that increases confidence. But we have a couple more sessions coming up. One is called A Better Way, Transforming the HIV Response for Adolescents and Young People. The other is Making the Future Disability Inclusive, bringing stakeholders together to change the future today. Of course. And now is your chance to catch Michelle Namankeng, uh, an amazing youth novelist from South Af Africa. She is in the top 10 of the world's youngest authors, which is incredible, as well as more news from our 1.8 reporters. Dear world leaders, we are tired of the empty words and promises that were long due are now running over time. This is our future that you are dealing with. We are the tomorrow, the affected, and not going to watch you throw away and lose it. Dear world leaders, don't you hear our cries and pleas for help? We come together from countries far and wide so that all our problems can share a chance to be in the light. You have made our homes the shadow for far too long, and now it is time for us to echo our song. Dear world leaders, we are the younger generation, brave and bold. We will be there for you. We will do everything for you. We will listen to you. But that is only what we have been told. We deserve peace after a lifetime of war. After all the petitions, letters, protests and policies, none of the solutions to our altercations are ever guaranteed. Enough is enough. We won't back down. We will soar above the crowd. Remaining silent will be a disappointment for those before us who fought loud and proud. We will no longer be shamed for the things that make us who we are. Dear world leaders, you are not helping us, don't you see? We still hunger and thirst for our basic needs, and you turn a blind eye to those who bleed. Poverty is a monster in which the earth is its home. It spreads and attacks with evident ways and you just let it roam. We twist and turn in all the pain and torture. How many more tears have to drop before there is none of us left? We still need our closure. Dear world leaders, we are tired, not of fighting, but of this game. You keep rewriting chapters and skipping our pages. We don't deserve to experience this at our young age. We cannot sit and watch as our childhood is slowly being taken away from us, losing its grip and holding on to its last breath. But the hands of injustice and unfairness keep pushing it down, making it fall again and again. Enough of the leaders. Now I say, dear young people, I tell you now, the rain will not be here forever. The sun will come out. We will sing together. Running in circles and connecting as one, just like the old days. Your voices are going to be heard. You won't remain the silhouettes that people in the light trample on. Your story will change. Our tears will stop falling. They will stop all the mocking. We will walk down those streets without pounding hearts of fear, without the stalking. We will get that education that we have called for with our piercing looks from others. We will grow. No more being shut behind doors where unspeakable things emerge. No more feeling terrified of staying with someone who makes your stomach and head throb with pain. 
no more keeping silence about menstrual health just because people cannot behave mature enough for their age. Dear world leaders, we won't live under the title of those people who only talk nonsense. Under the title, they do not know what they want or where they are heading, or it's only getting worse because you keep wearing a short skirt. Weather is getting out of hand with hot and cold having no limits, with wildfires and disasters making places one huge pit. We are ready to wake up. It is our time now. We will rise and shine like the break of dawn. And through all that hard work and perseverance, that will be a gift to us all. Thank you. And my name is Michelle Inkamangi. Welcome to Aki, a period tracker app for girls like you. My name is Ari. Use Aki to get to know you by tracking what's going on with your body and mood every month and learn about periods in fun ways. Create an account and choose an Aki friend like me to accompany you. This is your monthly menstruation cycle. Each shape is a day of the month. And this number is your personal countdown. It shows how many days until your next period or how many days left of your current period. Track your mood, period flow, body, and activities with emojis on the daily cards. See your whole month at a glance. And check out the Aki menstruation and puberty information to learn new things about your body and health. And don't forget to send me some love. Welcome, friends, to Aki. Four girls, five girls, period. News. Today we're here at the House of Laws to speak to the powerful people who make decisions about your life, your health and your well-being. And we are here to get your voices heard today. Thank you, uh, Lord Collins, for hosting uh, us and for your leadership on the well-being of adolescents. PMNCH is convening the 1.8 billion Young People for Change campaign, a global youth-led effort to mobilize, increase, better actions for adolescent well-being. Young people have a real sense of kind of lack of trust with people who are making decisions for their life. What could you tell us today, and what could you tell young people out there today that's really going to reassure them that you guys are really making the right decisions for their health and their well-being, and the things that really affect them in, in life today? Thank you. So Save the Children has just released released something called the Adolescent Health and Nutrition Index. And the purpose behind this piece of work is to really identify how far our country is going really to support adolescents and young people. So we've looked at you know, health nutrition indicators and gender indicators across 75 low and middle income countries and also looked at what are the policy and financing provisions in these countries. So if you're a young person out there and you're keen to advocate for yourself, please join our index, go online and look at it and find out what is your government doing in your country to support you to meet your health and nutrition needs. And hopefully you can also provide feedback to us. Unite!
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for making the time to join in on this session today. And our session title is A Better Way, Transforming the HIV Response for Adolescents and Young People. My name is Ngosa Kulula. I'm a passionate sexual reproductive health rights advocate from Zambia. And I'm a member of the Education Pass Initiative as well. And I will be co-moderating this session um, with my friend Deborah today. Deborah, I invite you to introduce yourself. Wow, thank you Ngosa. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone from wherever you are joining us from. I am Leticia Deborah Akumu. I come from Uganda. I am a passionate advocate for HIV and sexual reproductive health for adults and girls and young women. Over the years, I've transpired uh, to develop programs and implement programs that respond to the needs of the young women. Thank you. Back to you, Ngosa. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction, Deborah. We're so happy to have you and I'm happy to be co-chairing this session with you. We would also like to get to know you, get to know your names and where you're joining us from. So please feel free to just write your name and your country in the chat box and let's keep it interactive, youthful and engaging. And uh, just looking forward to an interesting session that uh, we put together for you today. We have an interesting lineup and um, I'm just excited to be delivering this session alongside Deborah. So this session will focus on addressing the diverse and met health and well-being needs of young people affected by HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. The session will be in two parts. Firstly, we'll hear testimonials from six youth leaders in the HIV movement, highlighting adolescents' concerns, innovative solutions, and ongoing challenges. In the second part, we'll be joined by a multi-sectoral panel facilitated by myself and Deborah. And in our discussion, we'll address financial and systematic barriers hindering adolescents from accessing essential services and how we can foster collaboration so we can remove obstacles to vital resources and support. And while great strikes have been made towards ending AIDS, we are still not where we need to be to end AIDS by 2013. Every three minutes, an adolescent girl or young woman aged 15 to 24 years acquired HIV in 2024 in Sub-Saharan Africa. Key populations, which are also disproportionately affected by HIV, continue to be marginalized in the HIV response. And so while the picture may seem bleak, there are adolescents and youths like myself and yourself who are tirelessly advocating for the health and well-being of young people. And you're about to hear from six of them now. But just a quick reminder before we get into the video, um, I would request that if you have any questions that come up as we go through the session, please feel free to leave them in the chat and we have colleagues who will be answering your questions and they'll provide feedback to each and every one of you. Deborah, over to you. Please do not forget to register in the chat. We want to know whom we have in the room. And thank you so much to our online audience for joining. We are about to hear uh, from six uh, young people from across Africa. We have Uganda, Kenya, Ivory Coast, and Nigeria plus Zimbabwe. In the video that is about to play, they will share, they will share some concerning issues that are affecting young people within their countries. We shall also specify the gaps, as well as understand what the barriers are towards uh, the health and well-being of young people in Africa. And, and uh, I will request the audience, uh, the online audience, to give us feedback after the videos have been played. So watch carefully, listen carefully, and enjoy. My name is Nyanzu Uzai, a youth coordinator at St. Francis Healthcare Services, Njeru, Jinja, Uganda. My role is to ensure young people have access to quality, affordable, and non-discriminatory holistic services. A recent observation in my work is increasing cases of organ failure, that is liver and kidney, and opportunistic infections among young people. A more concerning observation is that clinics most especially in rural areas where I come from, do not have the necessary equipment 
to run and monitor these t tests. When facilities do have them, they are not affordable to young people. The Ministry of Health guidelines strongly recommends administration of these tests to people on DTG. However, that's not the reality we are seeing on the ground. And as a result, we are losing lives to causes that can be prevented. Therefore, as new drugs are being recommended for HIV treatment, I am calling for investments to be made so as young people can have access to healthy care services and routine tests such as the renal and the liver tests. Thank you. Je m'appelle Noura Fatine Touré, j'ai 22 ans, je vis dans la ville d'Abidjan en Côte d'Ivoire. Je suis militante pour la promotion de l'éducation complète à la sexualité des adolescents et jeunes. Aujourd'hui, les adolescents et jeunes de ma communauté ont des priorités et des besoins variés. Nous avons soif d'éducation complète à la sexualité, de services de santé adaptés à nos besoins. Nous voulons éliminer la stigmatisation et garantir l'accès équitable à des services de qualité. Et nous voulons avoir notre mot à dire lors des prises de décision concernant notre bien-être. Pour répondre à ces besoins, nous avons travaillé d'arrache-pied en mettant en place des programmes d'éducation complète à la sexualité afin que chaque jeune puisse acquérir des connaissances et des compétences essentielles. Nous avons également mobilisé notre communauté autour du processus de l'engagement de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre pour des adolescents et jeunes éduqués en bonne santé et épanouis, proclamés par nos ministres à Brazzaville. D'ailleurs, nous avons présenté l'engagement aux institutions de mon pays. L'éducation sauve des filles et doit être une priorité. C'est pourquoi nous appelons nos dirigeants à respecter leur engagement pris à Brazzaville. My name is Faith, a peer educator from Chieza Organization in Zimbabwe. A concerning issue in my community is child marriages. In Water for Zimbabwe, for every five girls, three of them suffer child marriages. The girls are usually from poor families with loss of esteem, loss of worth, and not in school. As a result, being married becomes an avenue to a better future or so they think. Child marriages threaten girls' well-being as they are more likely to experience gender-based violence and put them at an increased risk to acquire HIV. Grassroots organizations like Chieza have holistic supports in place to reach to girls at greatest risk and challenges the inequalities that allows human rights violation to thrive. Therefore, I urge you to increase sustainable funding for community-led organizations to empower them to continue implementing programs aimed at addressing pressing social issues such as child marriages so we can continue towards ending AIDS in 2030. Thank you. Bonjour, je suis Tara Nikema, présidente de l'ONG Woman Leader et je travaille avec les jeunes adolescents sur les questions de santé sexuelle et reproductive euh, en Côte d'Ivoire. Alors en tant que jeune activiste en Côte d'Ivoire sur les questions de santé sexuelle et reproductive, nous rencontrons plusieurs défis euh, sur euh, la santé des jeunes adolescents en Côte d'Ivoire. Alors, il s'agit de la précarité menstruelle. Aujourd'hui, nous avons 68% de femmes en âge de procréer dans les zones rurales qui ne bénéficient pas de serviettes périodiques. Et euh, il y a également un manque de formation et d'informations euh, sur les jeunes, sur les questions de santé. Et un manque de moyens de contraception et le harcèlement sexuel que vivent les jeunes filles euh, dans les communautés. Alors, avec mon ONG, nous avons distribué des serviettes périodiques, des moyens de contraception dans huit zones rurales de la Côte d'Ivoire et pu prendre également en charge plus de 20 cas de viol et de harcèlement. Alors ce que je pourrais demander au gouvernement comme plaidoyer, c'est de mettre en place des espaces sûrs et fonctionnels pour les jeunes où ils pourront bénéficier de formations et d'informations, où ils pourront également bénéficier de moyens de contraception et euh, en deuxième lieu, de mettre en place des cellules de VBG, surtout fonctionnelles euh, dans les mairies pour la dénonciation des cas euh, de violences basées sur le genre et également de distribuer des kits de dignité pour les jeunes filles. Merci. Hi everyone, my name is Roel Okeyo, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. And in every city, there are voices unseen and stories unheard. For the LGBTIQA community, these punitive policies become chains, limiting freedoms and potentials. These policies further restrict access to HIV services, making health a privilege and not a right. 
policies that marginalize, discriminate, and punish on the basis of identity further perpetuate cycles of violence, homelessness, and health disparities. For the LGBTIQA community, restrictions to basic rights such as access to restrooms impose daily struggles. Discriminatory hiring practices have seen many unemployed, if not homeless. If we are to end AIDS in 2030, we need to ensure that the LGBTIQA community is not left behind. I am calling on investors for the protection of the LGBTIQA community and non-discriminatory access to health services and employment. Thank you. My name is Agoti Victoria Ugoma. I am 17 years old. I live at Africa North Ebony State, Nigeria. I am a peer educator and an advocate for school health program for adolescents. At 15, I did not have accurate and factual information on central and reproductive health. My life skills were not built, so I did not have refusal skills to say no and mean no. I was pressurized to have sex. The first time I did, I got pregnant and dropped out of school. Principal of my school, through the intervention of the school health project, took me back to school to write my exams. And after having the baby, I am reintegrated back to school. Our teachers, who were also trained, have taught us accurate and factual information on sexual and reproductive health. The school health program has empowered me with life skills. And as a peer educator, I am committed to training other adolescents. Wow, very powerful voices from the young people across Africa. Do not forget to check uh, the speakers section so that you can know more about the young people that we have just had and listened from. They had very powerful issues concerning uh, the health and well-being of young people. Uh, I will I will share my uh, taking notes from, from the videos that we just watched. And uh, we're going to have an opportunity for us to share one or two words uh, from what we've just watched and what we think about is happening with the health uh, of young people in Africa. Uh, I am the, the, There is a, a Metimeter link that has been shared in the chat. So kindly please go to the chat and type one, you know, any word that you feel like could describe how you feel uh, how you feel or how your experience has been after watching the, the, the videos. Um, I think we need to make sure that uh, uh, we need to ensure that adolescents have access to correct and appropriate non-judgmental sexuality education uh, so that they can be knowledgeable about and where to access services from, especially sexual reproductive health services and HIV services in general. Uh, we also need to eliminate the legal and, you know, the poor legislative constraints uh, and financial, financial barriers uh, that limit uh, access uh, to adolescents' health as we ensure equitable, accessible, available, affordable, and uh, a whole, in, in whole general, access to universal health coverage for young people in all their different diversities. At this point, I request our online audience to uh, click on the, on the Metimeter link. Please kindly just share any word, two words of what you've really got from the videos as I just shared mine. It could be one sentence, it could be one word. And please do not forget to uh, register in the chat as well. Thank you.
Yeah, Deborah, I'm excited to hear what um, everyone's key takeaway is. Um, looking forward to the responses. That was a very powerful video. You're right, Ngosa. I am also very excited to see and read what the young people are sharing with us because I am very, very well you know, uh, encourage that we have a lot of young people from the diverse uh, settings within Africa and, you know, across the globe joining us online. And I am just eager to read what they have shared with us, what they have learned, what they have understood from the videos, but also they might also be willing to share, you know, what happens in their countries concerning adolescents' health. So please feel free to share what you feel, what you've got from the videos, but also you might be willing to share your experience as a young person. So we are very, very much excited. Please do not forget as well to uh, register in the chat. We want to know whom are we having? Where are you from? Please do not forget to put your country as your registering. Viva young people, so let's do this and boom it. As the young people are, you know, trying to send in their responses, um, allow me to thank our online audience for joining us in big numbers. We are really, really so much humbled to have you uh, people here, our panelists and, 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 and my co-moderator, Angosta. Thank you so much for joining the call. Uh, it is such an exciting experience for us to have you all on this call. It is so, so fantastic and wonderful. I will read uh, the young people's responses at this point. Uh, someone is saying it's pain, it pained them. Uh, powerful of power of peers, this is so fantastic. Youth voices to be at the center of our programming. This is so wonderful, empowered and enlightened strength and resilience. We must be serious about ending AIDS in 2030, and that means no discrimination, equal access for all. Youth leaders should be at the center. These are very powerful responses. Youth have expertise. <laughs> this is so fantastic. I'm seeing young people taking on the lead. Uh, uh, Fatopol, uh, okay, this is, I think, a language I can't read at the moment. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, the young people. Thank you so much, everyone in the room that has uh, responded to the Metimeter. It is so fantastic. I'm, I'm aware more our responses are still coming in and we are eager to read them and we are recording everything. So we have everything on document. Just feel free to share uh, more. As you feel, feel free to share more. Uh, I think one of uh, the outstanding responses that has really, uh, you know, taken my thoughts is youth have the expertise. It is very, very key for us to recognize young people has expertise in everything they do. I am very, very much happy that young people are now starting to advocate for, you know, not thinking about them as beneficiaries of programs, but also, you know, programmers and, you know, are developers of these programs. It makes it much more better and encouraging for young people to join the programs when they see that young people have created the programs. That is why we stick on the saying that says, um, nothing for us without us. It, everything has to be about us young people. And the fact that there needs to be a recognition on our diversity and gender needs is also very, very vital. So I am happy that the young people are bringing out uh, you know, issues like 
we must be serious about ending AIDS in 2030. And this means no discrimination and equal access for all. So we need these programs to be responsive to our needs in our diversities, uh, the strength and the resilience that young people have showed out. Young people have come out and spoken about their HIV status, about the issues they're facing, menstrual health management, uh, access to health services is a challenge. So the resilience that we are bringing out is very, very key and fundamental. Youth leadership at the center, this is also another wonderful one. It is so fantastic that young people want to take on the lead of the different programs that are being implemented in their countries and also being recognized beyond being beneficiaries. Um, Pained. It is so, so painful. The experiences of young people, what we go through is so much painful. We have gone through sexual assault. We have gone through stigma and discrimination. We have gone through drug outstock. We have gone through, you know, sexual commodity outstock. We have gone through a lot of things and it is very, very painful. So I hear someone who says it is painful, but we are working towards progressing. And I am sure by 2030, we shall have, you know, reached our agenda and worked towards it uh, the power of peers peers have very very strong power and they have helped and supported a lot of people to respond to their health issues so i would want to end here and say thank you to everyone that has you know uh taken part in the uh i'll call it a challenge to send in a response it was so fantastic i'll hand over to my colleague ngosa Thank you so much for facilitating um, the video and the Mentimeter, Deborah. It was so enlightening to hear everything that youth have to say about the fight against HIV, speaking from their lived experiences. And indeed, the experts of youth-led change are young people who are on the ground leading change. And it was just amazing to hear from them. We are now moving on to hear from our panel, who will be responding to concerns shared by young people and the kind of investments needed to be put in place to promote young people's health and well-being. Allow me to introduce our amazing uh, panel of duty bearers. Um, we are joined by Dr. Owen Muburungi, who is a Director AIDS and TB Unit from the Ministry of Health and Child Care, Zimbabwe. Dr. Owen, you're welcome. Uh, allow me to also introduce Perry. Dilani, who is the Global Team Leader, Safe and Healthy Learning Environments from UNESCO. Welcome. Thank we you also so have Ida Achayo, who is the Community and Social Support Manager from Reach Out Mbuya Community Health Initiative, Uganda. You are welcome and thank you for joining us. And last but not least, allow me to also introduce Tia Palermo, who is president at Policy Research Solutions. Welcome, Tia. Thank you all so much for making the time to join us today, and we look forward to this discussion. So to kick off our discussion, we will start with you, Tia. We just heard how punitive laws and policies result in poor health outcomes for marginalized communities. How then can we create a more conducive policy environment for multi-sectoral responses that address the social determinants of HIV for youth, especially for traditionally marginalized gender groups? Thank you for that question. We need to take a holistic approach in terms of advocacy, policymaking, and healthcare. Structural factors like poverty and economic insecurity affect adolescents' risks of HIV infection and adherence to treatment among people living with HIV and AIDS. For example, the DREAMS Partnership which aims to reduce rates of HIV among adolescent girls and young women in high burden countries, includes comprehensive economic strengthening as a core element in its package of services. In addition, the UN AIDS strategy 2021 to 2026 now includes social protection under multiple results areas. Social protection is defined as the set of policies and programs aimed at preventing or protecting all people against poverty, vulnerability, and social exclusion throughout their life cycle with a particular emphasis on vulnerable groups. A common type of social protection program in Africa is a cash transfer. A holistic approach to the HIV response recognizes that economic security and health are mutually reinforcing. Adolescents can only reach their full potential when policies and interventions address these together. 
Economic insecurity can increase adolescents' risk of HIV by creating an environment in which adolescents may have to drop out of school, engage in risky behaviors, or stay in relationships where gender-based violence is occurring, all of which increase their risk of HIV. With colleagues at UNICEF, the National Institute for Medical Research in Tanzania, and Policy Research Solutions, we recently synthesized the evidence from multi-sectoral interventions targeting adolescents with both economic strengthening and health or life skill components. We found these interventions were effective at improving economic security, HIV prevention knowledge, gender-based violence, and mental health. Results were split in terms of HIV risk where half of interventions found protective effects and half found no change. In terms of advocacy, we need to communicate clearly with policymakers that efforts to address HIV cannot be siloed. Ministries of Health and Ministries of Social Welfare or Community Development need to work together at national and local levels to invest in adolescents, including through initiatives to link social protection programming with the health sector. Zambia has made significant progress in the area of health sector linkages, and in Tanzania, there is a bill now being considered in Parliament which would allow national cash transfer participants to enroll in the Community Health Fund with a premium fee waiver. Advocacy efforts for multi-sectoral HIV programming for adolescents can emphasize both the benefits of multi-sectoral holistic approaches, but also their cost effectiveness and opportunities for cost sharing across sectors. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response, Tia. I like that you bring out the effectiveness and the economic benefit that a multi-sector approach has. Um, and I hope this is something that you know, we can still put out and recommend further. You've highlighted countries that have been able to integrate and link social protection with the health sector and the benefit that it has um, had so far in the fight against HIV and AIDS. So thank you so much for that response. And I'm eager to hear from um, other panelists as well. So I will go to you, uh, Hilda. So Hilda, through your organization, Reach Out to Mbuya, it supports um, adolescents' economic empowerment and healthcare needs. Community-led organizations like yours play an important role in mobilizing resources and responding to community needs. Yet we continue to see power imbalances and hegemony of funding where community-led organizations are not adequately catered for. What does sustainable financing of grassroots youth-facing NGOs like yours look like? Over to you, Hilda. Uh, thank you so much. And um, like you have rightly put it, the community-led uh, grassroots organization have uh, a key role to play in terms of uh, meeting the needs and the demand of the young people like you heard from their responses, they have high expectation and this need to be financed. And um, as a, a grassroots organization, we are in a very competitive development space where you have to, um, you have to be able to look for the funding in the general space with the other actors. And so we have to position ourselves and be relevant in order to tap this financing so that we, we have uh, sustained financing for all our programming. And what does that take as an, uh, a grassroots organization? First of all, you have to ensure that you are uh, a recognized institution, you're legally registered because no donor would want to associate with someone who is not legally registered. So you have to position yourself and have a strong uh, a strong system and strong uh, human resource so that you're able to sustain the little funding that you get as a grassroots organization. As a grassroots organization, you also have to diversify your funding sources. You don't put your eggs in one basket. Ensure that you have uh, varied funding from various sources. And also you have to... Uh, be able to use the, the resources that are given to you properly. And uh, you also explore expo uh, possibilities of having flexible funding. 
uh, that can be done. You can either have a social enterprise membership fee. You can also invest in bonds if you can, but you have to have some level of uh, flexible funding that can sustain you in the event that there is any kind of uh, drought. Uh, the other thing is that um, usually uh, people are supported as a result of their work. And as grassroots organization, we need to invest in documenting our successes uh, and be able to ensure that we are visible in the, in the space. There we can easily be identified and have continued funding. So we have to be really visible, take advantage of the space, whether it's through your website or X or any other platform that uh, we, we use to ensure that you are known out there. We also have to build a very strong relationship. Uh, we have to build relationship among the, the networks we work, the CSOs, the government. And of course, this is built from where you stand strong. You should know your niche as an organization and be able to work in consortia with other partners, other organizations, for you to be able to tap the funding that is uh, sustainable. So. We also have to take advantage of the, the current uh, funding trends. Uh, most donors these days are talking uh, localization and we really want to work with the grassroots organization. Therefore, we have to position ourselves in order to tap into that funding space uh, for the local organizations. Uh, like we rightly put it, uh, while we are working with the, the young people, we have to work with them in order to sustain this funding. Like they said, they, they are skilled and they have the talent. And so if they are part of your, your program, then it's it's much easier to for you to also market what uh, they are engaged in. It's a competitive space, so you have to be visible, you have to be legally registered, you have to, to always look out for the leads to see where the opportunities are. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Hilda. And I think I really like the fact that you highlighted the flexible funding that we have to look out for to ensure that we have unrestricted source for us to do more and have more impact in terms of our programming and the work that we're doing in our communities. And I believe a lot of young people out there uh, who are leading community-led uh, organizations uh, have learned so much from the feedback that you have provided. I will now move on to Mary. And so Mary, evidence shows that there are multiple social and economic benefits to young people, especially girls, when they complete secondary school. So how can we better utilize schools and educational institutions to play a better role in the transformative HIV response for youth? Thanks, Ngosa. Really great to be here and to uh, have this opportunity to, uh, to share some ideas. Uh, well, you just answered um, uh, uh, your first question. Uh, in terms of uh, what we can do to make sure that schools are playing this appropriate role in the transformative HIV response. And one of the first answers is, is the one you just provided about keeping young people, bringing young people to schools and keeping them there, um, especially um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, girls and young women. Uh, we know that that has a huge protective effect um, and we need to ensure that schools are, are able to do uh, everything they can to make that happen. Um, uh, we heard in one of the videos about a girl who had fallen pregnant, but uh, was able to have her baby and come back to school. That's a very important policy aspect. Um, other uh, things that happen in schools beyond the classroom, like school feeding, um, um, appropriate extracurricular activities. There's a number of, of things that schools do to ensure that they're meeting the needs just beyond just the education needs uh, of the children that attend. Schools also need to make sure that the, the climate that's established in the school acknowledges that, a, that HIV is not over, uh, that it's a prevention issue every single day for young people, uh, and that many young people are living with HIV. Uh, and without saying we should normalize uh, what is an incredibly difficult situation, we need to ensure that it acknowledges that this is the reality uh, for, for most people, living with HIV and also coping with what it takes to stay negative, uh, which isn't 
uh, always easy. Uh, another aspect of what happens in schools uh, is around school health services. And we need to make sure that school health personnel, uh, they know about HIV, they can talk about it, uh, they're comfortable uh, talking with adolescents about uh, issues around HIV and sexuality, that they know about sexual and reproductive health, uh, and that they're well hooked in so they can refer young people to healthcare services when they need them. Um, and, and the other, of course, a very important things that school do is, is through education itself. Uh, and, and UNESCO has been working for, for a long time on comprehensive sexuality education, trying to ensure that the recommendations that we provide uh, are uh, comprehensive in that they uh, address a whole range of uh, issues around sexuality, not just biology, not just reproduction, uh, but issues around gender, the social construction of gender, in, in power relations, the issue of personal safety, uh, communication skills. We also heard from uh, in one of the videos about the importance of, of communication and refusal skills when one uh, wants to refuse, because these are all around social and uh, sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, so, and we know from the evidence, um, and we also heard from, from Tia about the studies they've been doing, that there are programs that work. We know what works. We have evidence to prove that sexuality education brings enormous benefits. Uh, so those are the two things through education and in schools themselves that we're recommending uh, that schools do uh, to ensure that they're doing their job as part of the transformative HIV response. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that really insightful response, Mary Green. Uh, I like that you highlighted how education is a strategic entry point, the benefits that keeping girls and young people in school has in ending AIDS as we look at ending AIDS by 2030, from the protective factor to also the comp comprehensive sexuality education that they access within that space. And I hope, uh, like you've said, we know what works. I hope we can make the most out of the platforms and spaces that exist to harness our fight against HIV. So thank you very much for that. I'm excited to hear from the other panelists as well. So I'll now hand over to Deborah to take it over from here. Thank you so much, Ngosa. That was a very, very powerful session from our, the half of, our, of the panelists that we have. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, as our panelists have shared a lot around uh, the programs that are being implemented, the second uh, chance for you know young people to go back in school, the school health programs, sexuality education frameworks, and uh, other programs that are being implemented, but also the financial barrier constraints around uh, 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 community-based organizations. Uh, since the beginning of the HIV epidemic in the 80s, there has been a great evolution of prevention options like PrEP, available to curb the transmission of HIV. However, just because it is available does not mean it is accessible to everyone. To you, Dr. Owen, how do we ensure the latest medical and technological advancements in HIV treatment better cater to the needs of marginalized groups quickly and dignified with access to multiple prevention methods? Uh, did we lose Dr. Owen? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry, I have some connectivity problems, but I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to hear what I have to say. Uh, this is a very important and relevant uh, question. The most important thing is to start by saying that we need to make sure that we address the structural and systematic barriers that uh, hinder access to services, specifically the sexual and reproductive health services for young people. We know that in a lot of times, young people are treated as subordinates. They are usually chaperoned when they seek health services, and they don't have the power 
to go and seek health services on their own. So we need to start by deconstructing and making sure that the legislative agenda and the structural issues are dealt with. In most cases, young people do not have the economic power to go and seek health services. They have to go and ask a parent or a guardian again to be able to do that. So our systems should be child and youth friendly to make sure that our young people can access these services. The second bit is, of course, to create the awareness and the necessary um, information that is disseminated among us young people so that they can know what is available and where they can get it. And we know that today, the young people are probably the most ones that use the technology, the cell phones, WhatsApp, and all those things. And it has the power using that to reach the most of the remote areas in our population and also those that are disadvantaged, specifically our key populations and people with disabilities. So we need to utilize those so that our young people can get into that. We can also use mobile health services and telemedicine to make sure that they can actually consult or they can get information from service providers that can give them the necessary and the important um, information on where and how to get those services. The critical issue is, of course, making sure that whatever we're doing, we also take cognizance of the young people, they have the capacity, they have the expertise, and the leadership to provide all this. So PLA- uh, Dr. Owen, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but has, has you wrap, wrap it up? Thank you. Okay. So we use peer-led interventions using the young people to make sure that they come up with programs that are specific tailor-made for themselves so that they can access services for young, our adolescent girls, young, and we, young women, men or sex men, and uh, sex workers. We also can differentiate our services to make sure that the marginalized and those that do not usually have access can be treated and be provided with the services. So in short, all I'm saying is that uh, involving and making sure that the young persons are at the center of whatever we do in terms of uh, the research, the provision of uh, HIV prevention activities like PrEP and others is core to what we need to be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Owen. Uh, Dr. Owen sums up everything on uh, making sure that young people have to be at the center of their programs uh, in their different diversities. Uh, to This question goes to all our, our speakers. Uh, youth leadership is very, very key to getting more young people info, to information and access to services. Uh, how can youth leadership programs be integrated into the broader HIV response? Just uh, six seconds to every speaker. I'll start with you, Tia. Thank you. Thank you. Youth leaders can advocate for expanded social protection coverage and benefits to invest in young people, including in their health, education, and economic opportunities to ensure that they can fully participate in society. This investment has benefits for national economic growth, especially for countries that are still undergoing the demographic transition when the proportion of working age adults in the population grows and adolescents will be key to this one-time opportunity for economic growth. Adolescents who transition to adulthood with better health, including reduced HIV risk or increased adherence to treatment, 
and more educational attainment or vacation, vocational skills will be better able to take advantage of job opportunities, be more productive at them, and propel countries to poverty reduction and accelerated economic growth. It's not just about health, but rather how health, economic security, and national economic growth are intertwined. We can't have one without the other, and youth leaders are key to making this change. One example of facilitating youth leaders' voices in policymaker policymaking is UNICEF's We Deserve Better initiative. This focuses on elevating the voices of women and girls to participate in participatory policymaking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tia. I, I will have Mary just one second, just one minute, sorry. Thanks, Deborah. I would say that just as we're hearing from uh, youth organizations about nothing for us without us, uh, I think the, the the UN system, my agency, uh, other donor organizations, we need to move beyond uh, tokenism uh, and ticking off the, the community mobilization box uh, by putting a young person in a, in a seat at a meeting uh, and really move beyond uh, move towards meaningful engagement. Uh, and that's not just representing um, uh, and participating in a big international meeting, that's uh, engaging young people in the, the early stages of research, of policy design, uh, of uh, needs assessments um, uh, from the beginning and, and recognizing that this isn't free, uh, that young people do have the expertise to participate uh, with their with their skills and can make a, a, a contribution. Uh, and just like any other service that, that we need or procure, we need to find ways to fund that uh, in stable ways so we can take the best advantage of the skills and knowledge that, that young people and youth organizations bring to the table. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists. It's, it has been such a wonderful panel. Are recognizing the need to make sure that we have a better way to transforming the HIV response for adolescents and young people. I'll give it back to Ngosa. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists. It has been such an insightful discussion. And I think it just further cements why we need to meaningfully engage young people in issues that affect them. And we need to continuously invest in the leadership of young people as agents of change, but also as people with their own agency in ending AIDS in 20, uh, 2030. So while at the same time, we also have to hold governments and other world leaders accountable to prioritizing our health and well-being. I would just like to remind the audience to make use of the resources section to access reports and publications and some of the materials that have been referenced in this conversation, uh, just so we can, you know, be more informed when it comes to ending HIV by 2030. I would like just to give my deepest gratitude to the duty bearers, our panel our panelists. Thank you all so much for an insightful discussion. Thank you so much for the effort that you have put into making this session as informative and as interesting as it has been. I would like to also give my deepest gratitude to the young people on the pre-recorded videos. Thank you so much for putting out the demands. Thank you so much for putting out the needs of young people and adolescents and for being the voice of the voiceless. Thank you so much. And last but not least, allow me to thank the audience, the lovely audience, the participants. Thank you so much for your interaction through the chat box, through the Mentimeter. It has been amazing interacting with you all. And I hope we can still keep on interacting and carry on these conversations to make the impact that we need to make to end HIV by 2030. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for facilitating this session as well. Thank you all so much to the technical team as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.